Well, good morning and welcome back to our house here. Welcome to Stanmore Baptist Church. Whether you are in church this morning, enjoying seeing other people, or you're in your own home watching on the screen, wherever you are, God is with you and we rejoice to be meeting together like this. Just a reminder that at the end of the service, we should be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So you need to have some bread and wine or something ready to join with us in that precious moment. When we start our worship time together, we remember the words of Peter, who said, It is better if it is God's will to suffer for good doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to die for us. We thank you that he took upon him our sin as he took our flesh we thank you that he has opened the way for us to come into your presence, to know you as our Father. We pray that as we sing and worship and hear your word together, you would build us up and draw us ever closer into yourself as your children. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We give all glory to Jesus for what he has done for us, dying and rising again. Let's sing together. to a time of prayer now together. Let's compose our hearts in quietness before God, thanking him again for the way that Jesus has opened for us on the cross. We come to pray for the needs of the world, for our own needs. We come to our Heavenly Father, who knows what we need before we ask. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can know that your ears are open to our prayer because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We come as sinners needing your forgiveness and we thank you that in the cross we find your forgiveness. 
become as those who need your life because without you we are dead in our sin and we thank you that Jesus has risen again to give us his life so we pray dear father this day you remember especially today our queen we pray especially for your comfort your peace to surround her to fill her this very difficult time just pray that she would know herself upheld by the prayers of many many of her subjects and your people around the world we thank you for the life of prince philip for the example that he has left and we pray that you would continue to uphold and bless the queen as she continues to serve you in the leadership spiritually and politically of our country remember these days our muslim friends who are beginning the month of ramadan a month of fasting seeking your face lord we pray that you would have mercy on them and reveal yourself to them mm -hmm. give them dreams and visions show them that jesus christ is the way to yourself help them to understand the wonder of your grace to know you as a god of love a god of forgiveness a god who can be the heavenly father to them have mercy on muslims all around the world in these days as they set their faces seeking after you may they find the way the truth and the life in jesus and we pray for our world in all its need and sorrow the ravages wrought by covid are still going on lord we cry to you for all health workers and scientists who are battling this plague this pandemic we pray that you would give them strength and wisdom and we pray that in your own good time may it be soon that the tide is turned and that this, that this pandemic is driven away give wisdom lord we pray to all politicians who are deciding how to conduct the the nations of the world at this time here in britain and all around the world we think especially of brazil which seems to be the, epi, the, the epicenter of the pandemic just now. Have mercy there, we pray, dear God. Have mercy on all the world, because we know that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And we pray too for other trouble spots in the world. We think of Ukraine, we think of Myanmar, we think of so many places where war is being waged. Lord, bring your peace. Bring your kingdom to this world. Your yeah. kingdom come, O oh Lord. Yeah. Your rule begin in peace. Bless us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We have a time now to take up our offering. One of the things I have missed about not being able to be in church is just being able to contribute. Uh, it's not quite the same to uh, do it online, but you can do it online. The uh, code is on the screen for you now as we sing together uh, what a wonderful name and we bring our gifts to the Lord. Were the word at the beginning One with God the Lord knows high In hidden glory in creation Now revealed What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
death could not hold you The veil tore before you To silence the boast of sin and grace The heavens are roaring Praise of your glory For you are raised to life again You have no Thank you that you use our contribution to forward your kingdom, to make Jesus known. We thank you that you have a part for us, us to play in bringing your kingdom on. We pray that you would take these gifts and use them for your glory. Give wisdom for all who administer the Lord. Multiply them marvellously, miraculously, that through them all your name will be glorified for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's have our Bible reading now. Julian will bring it to us. The reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 3, commencing at verse 1. The True Righteousness In conclusion, my brothers, be joyful in your union with the Lord. I don't mind repeating what I have written before, and you will be safer if I do so. Watch out for those who do evil things. Those dogs, those men who insist on cutting the body. It is we, not they, who have received the true circumcision. For we worship God by means of his spirit and rejoice in our life in union with Christ Jesus. We do not put any trust in external ceremonies. I could, of course, put my trust in such things. If anyone thinks he can trust in, extern in external ceremonies, I have even more reason to feel that way. I was circumcised when I was a week old. I am an Israelite by birth of the tribe of Benjamin, a pure-blooded Hebrew. As far as keeping the Jewish law is concerned, I was a Pharisee, and I was so zealous that I persecuted the church. As far as a person can be righteous by obeying the commands of the law, I was without fault. But all those things that I might count as profit, I now reckon as loss for Christ's sake. Not only those things, I reckon everything as complete loss for the sake of what is so much more valuable, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have thrown everything away. I consider it all as mere refuse, so that I may gain Christ and be completely united with him. I no longer have a righteousness of my own, the kind that is, that is gained by obeying the law, I now have the righteousness that is given through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is based on faith. All I want is to know Christ and to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death, in the hope that I myself will be raised from death to life. I do not claim that I have already succeeded or have, done, or have already become perfect, I am striving to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has already won me to himself. Of course, my brothers, I really do not think that I have already won it. The one thing I do, however, is to forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. So I will run straight towards the goal in order to win the prize, which is God's call through Jesus Christ to the life above. 
All of us who are spiritually mature should have this same attitude. But if some of you have a different attitude, God will make this clear to you. However that may be, let us go forward according to the same rules we have followed until now. Keep on imitating me, my brothers. Pay attention to those who follow the right example that we have set for you. I have told you this many times before, and now I repeat it with tears. There are many whose lives make them enemies of Christ's death on the cross. They are going to end up in hell because their God is their bodily desires. They are proud of what they should be ashamed of, and they think of the things that belong to this world. We, however, are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. He will change our weak mortal bodies and make them like his own glorious body, using that power by which he is able to bring all things under his rule. So then, my brothers, how dear are you to me, and how I miss you. How happy you make me, and how proud I am of you. This then, dear brothers, is how we should stand, stand firm in your life in the Lord. Good morning. Welcome here once again. Uh, we've just sung, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun. And you might think, well, but it's been two weeks since Easter. Surely we've, we've moved on, haven't we? Um, why see an Easter hymn today? And that's exactly what we're going to try and look at today. Because the Bible teaches us, really and truly, believe me, from cover to cover, that the Easter story and the resurrection should be making a dramatic change in our lives all the time, every day. And not just a question of something we, we bring out and sing the hymns and, and, and put the message away in a box and take it out, bring it out next year and dust it over and start again and just do a little bit of Easter for a couple of weeks or a week or whatever. So let's, let's try and do that today and just think again about the differences resurrection could or should be making in our lives right at this particular moment in time and in the future months and years, not just for Easter Sunday a couple of weeks ago. So, well, we, we easily forget it and put it on the shelf. But if you've noticed in the secular press, they're not talking. They're talking about resurrection, using our word. They've hijacked it this year but they're using it differently from the way we do. Now, I'd just like to uh, read a couple of headlines. I'm sure you've come across this. This is not new. Um, some, one headline I read says, question, will UK society experience a resurrection after the horrors, horrors of COVID-19? Good question. But you know they're talking about that, don't you? You know, you know exactly what they mean. They're talking about things like, new fairer society, levelling up, getting rid of the north-south divide, east-west divide, whatever, fixing the NHS at last again, right? Changing works, work time, working from the office, changing use of office space, changing shopping patterns, changing everything, the whole show. And there's transport, it all needs to be changed, what this group are saying. We need a long-term, maybe two-generation resurrection that will go on and on and on. That sort of gradual, solid, directed change, that root and branch stuff, right? But then there's another group of headlines. Here's one here, no names mentioned. Mr. X needs a political resurrection to, to save his lacklustre and fading party. Don't try to guess who it is, doesn't matter. But what this lot are saying, well, really, Mr. X's crowd have lost their appeal. They're irrelevant. They've lost the plot. They really need a big bomb of new life breathed into them now. Otherwise, they'll disappear forever. A more lost the way, lost the way, uh, irrelevant. Now, these are two. Now, you can think of other headlines that you've read. But I just want to look at these two things here. These are very important because both of these are saying 
we need to do with the resurrection, our teaching and our doctrine, what these headlines are sort of suggesting. Long-term change is needed and long-term incorporation of resurrection truth into our lives is what we need and it affects all of life all of the time for all of us. Nobody's exempt. But it's we also need to be saying, well, maybe I have lost the plot. Maybe I, I have... I'm not quite where I should be at all. Maybe I've wandered off somewhere on a byway to nowhere, a dead end place. Do I need to change? Yes, I do. So we need to think about that. So they hijacked our resurrection word. They are hijacking it and using it. Okay. But in the passage we just had read to us by Gillian, the Apostle Paul has his go at hijacking a word which for us is also a contemporary word. It's our word, safeguarding. Wow. Safeguarding. So we're going to look at this. And I'm going to look at this passage that we read, as I said, from chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 1. This is a, a block, a teaching block. The chapter divisions are not inspired as Sean used to tell us, we have to skip over the divisions many times. But here's one here. Now, I'm going to, so this block here from 3 1 to 4 1, give us what I'm calling, uh, I've, got, I've got a name for it. It's my level one of, safeguard, of safeguarding training course for all Christians. This is only level one. There are more levels, as you well know. So here we go, level one. So 3 verse 1 says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write these, the same things to you again. And it's safeguarding for you, a safeguard for you. So rejoice, and that's part of the safeguarding. And I'm saying this with, you know, it's important. There's no trouble to talk about it. Go for it. And then at the end in chapter, in chapter 4 verse 1, at the end, the other end of the package, therefore my brothers whom I love and long for you're really beloved my joy and my crown that's how you should stand firm in the lord dear friends same language in the lord dear friends dear brothers this sort of book ending of this safeguarding package is very interesting because three one the beginning is always in, and here we go rejoice be lively get on with it have sparkle and then the other end, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, stand firm, dear friends. Straight as soldiers, feet stuck in the ground. It's kind of a bit dull and boring. The two ends are maybe like snap, crackle and pop versus a stodgy porridge. The trouble is, and the fact of Scripture, is that we need both these ends. We need to rejoice in the Lord, but make sure the Lord be rejoiced in as the Lord of Scripture, the doctrine Lord, taught in the Bible from A to Z. We need the doctrine of Scripture, all of it from A to Z, right, okay? But not just old, dry, dusty, dead doctrine stuck in the mud. We need sparkling, rejoicing doctrine. So here we go. So we need safeguarding, and this is level one. Here's the course coming up. We've got the bookends, and we can see how, it, well, hopefully you can see how it might work out. So what do we need safeguarding from? Well, it's, it's not difficult to look at. Just look at the verses. Verse 2 of chapter 3. Watch out for those dogs. Oh, well, some dogs need, we don't have a dog, but some dogs need to be. Keep your eye on them, right? Those mutilators of the flesh. Who are these? Well, this is the circumcision party. The Jerusalem party. Mostly based there around the temple kind of party. The Judaizers sometimes are called. The people from the book of Galatians. The people who made such a horrific fuss in Acts chapter 15, for example. This lot here. The people who could not accept the fact that Gentiles could be part of God's people. 
God never intended pagan Gentiles to be treated as, as anything but heretics. Cross and Jesus, waste of time, rubbish. Only the circumcised Jews are in. The rest of you are out. You're excluded, right? Can you imagine where you and I would be if that lot had prevailed? Well, read Acts 15 and, and you, you can work it out. Where would we be? Well, Irish people, we were worshipping trees and round magic stones and other things. We'd all be dread in our sins. We'd never heard the gospel had that lot prevailed. But here they're making such a fuss. They're dangerous because they're really saying, well, Romans 2, what Paul says, that's heresy. Gosh, what did Paul say? The true circumcisionist, he's got it here in this text as well. We, we are the circumcision. The true circumcision is this, is to worship God by the Spirit of God. We glory in Christ and we put no confidence in the flesh. That's what circumcision is all about. You see, circumcision was never meant to be just cutting the physical organ with a, a blade or whatever. No, that was only meant to represent what God really did want to do and does, does always still want to do with us. Do heart surgery, open heart surgery and circumcise our hearts. But he, he can't really very well do open heart surgery and everybody all the time through millennials of years. But you can... The circumcision ceremony was to say, really, my heart is cut by God, repentant. I repent of my sins. I love God. That's the real religion that, that Paul was talking about there in Romans chapter 2. Uh, at the end of it as well, we are the true circumcision. It's nothing to do with this here. These, this dead ritual going back to the past. This pull up yourself by your own bootstraps sort of religion. Just ritual. And I'll do it the way I've always done it. And this is the only way and the rest of you are no good. No. That was a big danger. Now Paul says here in, in um, verses, the next bit of the chapter, chapter three of, of Philippians. I mean, look, look at my CV. Look at the sort of person I was. I, I was perfect, circumcised in the eighth day, all done correctly of the people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, the in tribe, Hebrew of Hebrews, really true blooded one, Pharisee, zealous, evangelistic, faultless. I had it all. Well, I thought, until God met me and I met God. And the Spirit of God captivated me and took hold of me in the language he'll use later on. So that, that's one group. We need, we, we need safeguarding for this sort of people, this sort of religion that they represent. Religion, well, just self-made, man-made religion, literally made by ourselves, according to us and not according to Christ and the cross. Now, the other group we need safeguarding from here are quite different uh, from verses 18 and 19, chapter 3. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Why? Oh, what's wrong with this lot? Watch out. Their God is their stomach. What on earth is that about? It's just saying that their God, the only God, small g, that they worship, is are their own, well, big list. I made a list here. But it's their own desires their own appetites, their own projects, their own dreams, their own way of life, their own values, their own everything, right? Uh, their own achievements, their own money, their own everything, right? And who are they? Well, it says here their minds on earthly things. Their minds on earthly things, just purely things of this world. They're not interested in any God of either the Old Testament or the New Testament, Jesus, anybody else. They don't care. Their God is only their own little, their little project. Their own hedonistic, materialistic, this word, only sort of stuff. And you say, well, are these folk around? Yes, of course they are. We know them. These are the, a word I hate. These are the influencers of today. 
good grief. The celebrities, right? The people who are, well, you know who they are. You can put names to them. But they only, uh, this is this, uh, an intellectual, cultural, philosophical, scientific, political elite, so-called, who, who are guiding society and whose values, non-values, non-biblical ones, often determine our values and lead us astray. And we get sidetracked by this lot. Swept along and, and before long we realise suddenly someday, goodness me, do I think that? Did I say that? Is that what I really believe? Is that what the Bible teaches? No, stop. It's not. Danger. You need safeguarding. So we do need, um, in, you know, safeguarding from that lot. I mean, these people, this second lot here, they just say, well, you talk about sin. I'm not a sinner. Hell, medieval rubbish. Don't insult me by offering me a, a crucified Messiah and say, say I could be saved from hell, which I don't believe in any way to go to heaven, which I don't believe anyway. Don't insult me. I don't want this. I don't believe. And we need safeguarding because this can suddenly weave its way into us, right? The others, not the circumciders, aren't so subtle in a way. They're very upfront and blatant. It's wrong. Get back into Judaism, the old style religion stuff. But this lot here, both are dangerous. So what's the answer? Well, we have, we have here in this text that we're reading, we've had read to us, right? We've, we've got the antidote, the solution. Vaccine sort of, not really, but it's something will help us to avoid falling into these awful errors and safeguard us as we go through. And it's here, right plumb in the middle of the text of the chapter we read. Paul says, well, I want to know Christ. That's the secret, to know Christ. And to know Christ in biblical terms is not to stick your hand up in a meeting and, and sign a bit of paper. It's not to do that. Um, it, it's, it's just to, it's to really know Christ in an intimate way. That will help us and that will, that will keep us from falling into the error, into these heretical errors and these wrong perceptions. So how, how do we do it? What does Paul mean? Let's read the verse again, 10 and 11. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Verse 11, I want to attain to the resurrection of the dead. I want to get there. Really? Well, let's look at them. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Christ rose from the garden tomb to heaven. This is what the Bible says. And is at God's right hand now in heaven. And from that place, he exercises today his power now in me and on my behalf. That's where he is and that's what he's doing. He's not just sitting there and sort of thinking, oh, well, oh, look at the watch. Um, I'm bored, nothing to do. No, he's exercising power. And the resurrection, as someone said uh, recently, uh, the resurrection blew death off its hinges and opened the very gates of heaven, blasted open the gates of heaven. I like that. Just, it just finished with death. That's what the resurrection did, does, uh, and opened up the gates of heaven. Um, Peter talked about it in Acts um, chapter 2, verse 24. He said it was impossible for death to keep hold, to hold Jesus in. Well, we just sung that, right? We just sung that hymn. Death could not hold you. He, he, he had to be out because he's life. He's true life. So when Christ died and rose, death and Satan were decisively defeated. Now you can read about this in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14. If you want to make a note, you can 
read it afterwards. It talks here about Jesus came so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to free us, to destroy the power of death. Do we but really believe that? Do we? Um, it reminds me very much of the, the hymn, uh, an old Wesley hymn. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's light. Locked in, right? Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. Suddenly my dungeon flamed with light as on the Damascus road for Paul, for Saul, as he was then. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. Lockdown ended, I'm free. We're set free by the cross of Christ and the resurrection, which blew open, blew death off its hinges and opened the gates of heaven to us. So lockdown is over, we've been let out because that's the power of the resurrection in us and through us. Of course, right now, as any, well, blind or half blind person can see and, and realizes, the devil has been given. He's still on this uh, time he's got of limited freedom, right? But his power and his ultimate destiny is broken and his final defeat is sure. He, he knows that and he knows that. And if you want to read about that, you just, he knows his destiny is that, as you can read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. He knows that his destiny is the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. He'll never get out. Never, ever, ever and ever. And all those who he's tear, taking down with him, the slippery slope right into hell itself. He knows that's his end. But Revelation 12 tells us that meanwhile, and the language is very, 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 very interesting, that he's, he's, he was come down to heaven, to earth now with great power because he knows his time is short. I, I, I think the figure is just, he's, he's, uh, the language here is filled with fury. He knows that his time is short, Revelation 12. Verse 12, he's just like this little proverbial headless chicken, just tearing around madly, terrorizing everybody, everywhere, all the time, no exceptions, doing all the, the evil he can in the world to bring us all down. But that block there in Revelation chapter 12 is all about, well, yeah, that's happening, but we have the victory. And it's all about saying we can still, we can rejoice even in this time when Satan is having his, he thinks his heyday. No, it's his last and final death throes days. But we can rejoice because we know the blood of the Lamb has saved us. Behold, the Lamb of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's taken away my sin and the devil cannot hurt me because death and hell have been defeated in Christ. And we can sing praises to the Lamb as we're exhorted to hear, because the kingdom has come. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. The accuser is still here. He's tearing around, accusing, but he's been hurled down. We can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. So let's praise God, praise God and not give up. We do have nothing to fear. So we we don't fear the future, COVID, death, whatever. We don't need to. We're realistic. We know it's not easy right now. It's hard. It's a time of suffering and stress and stain, st strain and illness and, and cruelty and horrendous stuff happening and threats all over the place. 
but we can keep calm, not just carry on, keep calm and keep trusting in the blood of the Lamb, crucified, dead and buried. And we can say, thine be the glory, risen, conquering son. You've, you've gotten the victory for me. Now, the second thing that Paul talks about in Philippians, going back there, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. That's a strange word. How can I share in Christ's sufferings? What on earth could that be all about? Well, if you look back, and I'd like to look just back very briefly at John chapter 12. This is just one of the many times when Jesus talked about his suffering, the suffering he was going to, uh, what, well, go through. And I want to take out two things from this passage which are very important which are very pertinent to me, it seems to me at this time, that we, I can learn from um, Jesus' sufferings. The first thing that I learn, and, and I hope you I'm sure you've all learned it long before I ever did, right? Is to learn to talk to God himself and not just to talk about God. And that means I can tell him about, and I made a list of things that I can tell him about, and you maybe had another list, my fears, my doubts, my pain, my sorrow, my disappointments, sin, death itself, people I can't stand, people who drive me crazy. We can tell God. And the great thing is that God is totally unshockable. You'll never shock him because he knows already. Why hide it? So we get here in uh, John chapter 12, uh, verse, for example, 27. Jesus teaches us to do that sort of, to have that conversation with God. Here in verse 27, Jesus said, Now is my heart troubled, Lord, what shall I say? I don't know how to pray, Father. Father, save me from this hour. Is that how I should pray? You know I just... Don't want to go to, through this stuff. Bad enough coming from heaven to earth. That was horrendous. Coming to this jolly place. But now I've got to go to a cross. For t the terrorist death around here. And then I've got to go down to hell. I, I, I don't know. I don't fancy this very much, Father. I'd really prefer not to do it. But don't panic, Father. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Don't panic. I'm, I'm on track. I'll, I'll get through with it. I came for this very moment. I have to go through with it. And we remember those bystanders, those scorners who were just looking at him dying in the cross and sort of saying, <laughs> come down, look at him. He can't even save himself. Can't even come down from the cross. Exactly, they'd got it right. He couldn't. To save us, he had to die. He couldn't come down. He couldn't come off the cross. Had he come off the cross? No resurrection. No salvation for me or for you. So then he just says, well, okay, Father, verse 28. Okay, I'm on track. Just glorify your name. And the father with this great noise says, I have, I will. So that's how Jesus was praying at this particular time. And then the father says, um, I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. And then Jesus said, that voice was for your benefit, not for mine. Not for mine. Don't worry. I'll go through with it. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth on that cross, will draw all men to myself. So you see, he had to die. He knew he had to die. But we can learn from his suffering how to pray and how to just let 
let God be real in our lives, even as we suffer and go through the pain and trust him that he is the sovereign Lord of glory. And of course, God, God did glorify him and will glorify him again. And one day, as Philippians 2 reminds us, God exhort, he became obedient to death. He said, yes, Lord, I'll go through with it. Even death on a cross, horrendous death. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the, the highest, gave him the name that is above everything, that is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he, he did go through with it. He did go through with it. But he knew he was going back to his father. He knew he was going back to his father. And I just some, think sometimes about Hebrews 12, the, the verses that you we all know very well. How Jesus would just say, well, okay, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, keep our eyes fixed on him. Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, this scorning its shame. He went through it. He scorned the shame of the cross. Why? Because he knew he would get back to heaven, get back to glory, be there with God. We need to consider him. Think about Jesus when we're going through hard times. He went through it. He prayed through it with his father and he got the victory for himself and for us, for our salvation. Now, the second thing that uh, this chapter, going back to John chapter 12, just talks about is uh, just the verses before there, verse 26. Very interesting couple of verses. Well, he talks that, that whole block beforehand, 23 and so on. He talks about a kernel of wheat falling to the ground and dying. If it dies, it produces many seeds, much fruit. The man who loves his life will lose it. The man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Serve, serve, serve. Deny yourself. Give up your rights. And of course, those words have been, have been the message of this last week in this country by the, the late His Royal Highness Duke of Edinburgh. I think we're only, well, I, we've been driving this country for so long, but I have no idea. And I think that most of the population in, in this country and perhaps across the world, nobody's a clue about the breadth and depth of his service to Queen, country, to humanity, to so many people all over the world, to use everybody. Serve, serve, serve. And he did this. He submitted willingly, out of love. Out of love. He knew what he was going into. Well, he probably thought he did for a very long time. And he did it with grace and with love. Serving. Now, so Jesus talked, you will remember, about serving. He talked, for example, about deny yourself. Negative, you've got something to give up. Deny yourself. You have to give up things. You've got to serve. Serve, serve is time, it's effort, it's just everything. Serve, deny yourself. And then the positive side, take up your cross. Follow me, come on, after me. Don't panic. I'm not out like to kill you and make your life miserable. I just want to bless you. I won't hurt you. My yoke is easy, remember? Remember what I said? And just like Jesus, we're free. And we, we, we're invited to make this a free and conscious choice to give up and to follow. 
So we can, there's just two, two examples I would like to suggest to you. You can think of more yourself about how we might participate in the fellowship of Christ's suffering for us on the cross and what he accomplished on the cross and how it opened for us the gateway to heaven and to blessing, personal blessing, and to a life of freely given service that we give to Jesus and to others, to our community, to our neighbours, to our friends, to our family, to everybody. As we take on our mission in and to the world, whatever that may be, whatever shape it may have. <clears throat> now, if we go back to Philippians 3, just quickly uh, to finish. Paul's very honest here in verses uh, 12. He says, now, now, please don't think. Please don't think I, I've got it all sorted out. I'm still a work in progress. I don't panic. This is long time stuff. Even I am still still trying to work it out, work out what it means in my life. And if you look at some of the words we, we've had here, uh, in we have in this text, verse 12. I'm not perfect yet. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Christ grabbed me and got my attention and my knees on the Damascus road. He took hold of me and I'm, I want to take hold of that prize that he has for me. I'm keeping going. Remember Gavin's sermon last week about the soldier and the farmer and the athlete. Eyes fixed on the goal, training hard, working hard, going to get over the line. And, and we're all called to this. Verse 15. If you're mature at all, in any way you're mature, Christian, for any length of time at all, you need you need to be doing on this onward, heavenward, heavenward way, pressing towards the goal to win the prize for which God, God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. We're not called to the gutter of that second party who's, who's God is their stomach. We're not called to just replicate an old dead religious ritual. We're called heavenward to the prize we have waiting for us in Christ, the crown of glory that will never fade, as we read in 1 Peter, for example. So I'm pressing on, and we're all called to this verse 15 here of our, of our passage. But, but if you haven't got this right yet, well, well, you need to think about it. If at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. God will show you where you're missing it, where you're off track a bit. Ask God, but only let us live up to what we've already attained. Don't go backwards. Stop, ask God, and keep moving on. Don't give up. And that's very that's very important. And you need, perhaps you would like to read Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10 sometime. We must keep going on. And there are lots of hints there about the dangers of not and the way to go on into maturity in Christ and not give up on the gospel. And then Paul says in verse 17, something else where he, he's working on, join with others in following my example. Oh, really? He's just saying, Paul's saying, well, follow me. You can imitate me. And also my teaching. Take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. What I taught. You can imitate me safely. It's okay. I, I'll, I've shown you a good way. Now, I think that's challenging. Can we say to people, well, just look at me. You can imitate me in word, thought, and deed. Right? Can you, can you say that to your kids? To your grandchildren? All I say... All I think and all I do, you can imitate me. I've got it put together. I won't lead you astray. That's a challenge for me, isn't it? I hope it's a challenge for you too. We need to take that on board. And Paul says, I, I, you can do it. Wow. That's a, a, a very high benchmark, isn't it? And then the last thing that Paul says here is that heaven is our home. He uses a, a very lovely language. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
we're citizens of heaven. We're not, we're not like, you know, illegals smuggled in by the back door into heaven. We're citizens. We've got, we've got the documents all there. Um, in my father's house are many mansions, Jesus said. Do you remember? Lots of houses, lots and lots of rooms. Room f for everybody. Right. I I'm going to prepare a place for you, just for you. Personalized. Decorated just for me. And I will come again and receive you to myself. So, so that's, that's our future. That's our hope. That's what Jesus has accomplished, what Easter is all about. That's why we sing, thine be the glory. My chains fell off. I'm let out of the prison of sin and death and hell. I, I love, and I'm sure many of you remember, the words of Job, chapter 19. And what Job, away at the beginning of the Bible, right? He's a, he's a patriarchal age person. Abram kind of stage of, of revelation, very likely, of, of revelation of God's truth, of Bible. And what he says, it's very, very, well, you know, we know the words. You sing them in the Messiah, you sing them at, well, maybe even over Easter, right? I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand upon the earth. Just like Philippians 2. Just like Revelation. He is the king of glory, the king of the world. The only wise, true God, the living God. Who will reign forever and ever. Whose kingdom will never, never end. And then he goes on to say, good old Job. And after my flesh has been destroyed, the worm Sing, we sing in the Messiah, though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another, can you imagine? I go to see God. And then he says at the end of verse 28, or 27 of Job 19, how my heart yearns within me. I can't wait for the day. So we will see God, and I will come and get you, and yeah, you're going to see God. And that just reminds me, opening a short parenthesis, just that verse from Job, those verses from Job remind me and all of us that we just need this standing firm in Bible truth of our safeguarding package, don't we? The whole of the Bible, all the truth of the gospel, because this gospel truth of God's forgiving, arm-stretched-out love is in all of Scripture from beginning to end, as also at the destiny of the destiny of those who reject that love. It's there in the whole of the Bible. There is always forgiveness with God. Still, it's still time. The day of grace is still here for all of us. So let's finish by just. Going, let's go back to our safeguarding. The first lot, dangerous crowd. I did it my own way, religion, trust in my ritual, and so on. And Paul, in verse 8 of Philippians 3, says, it's rubbish, dung, manure heap stuff. No good, no future in that. The other lot, I refuse all religion. Religion is totally irrelevant. I'm a secularist, a humanist. I have no God except myself and the gods I make. The gods I like, the gods I choose, the gods of my fantasy and of my little limited world. And I, I don't care about anything else or anybody else. We need safeguarding from those two extremes. We really, really do. So what do we so, so what do we dis, what do we deduce then to finish off? What what, what should be our, our attitude be? These two these are dead ends. The first lot is the manure heap, and the second lot is worms. What's the difference? They are literally dead ends. 
So what we really need, well, is, is just what Paul's offering us. Rejoice, stand firm. We need a passion for Christ to live, and I put it, I put it like this here to myself, a life-changing, mind-blowing life in the power of his resurrection, to live and to serve selflessly as Christ did. I need that. We all need that. But at the same time, we all need the solidity of sound doctrine, Bible, all of Scripture, including, especially in our day and age, two great doctrines. The reality of sin and lostness and of hell without Christ. The destiny of the lost is real. And we mustn't be afraid to spell it out today. But also we have to hold in our heads and hearts. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. John 3, 16 as well. God so loved the world that he gave everybody. We need to keep it all together. It's hard to do it. It's hard to do it. So keep safe. Keep safe. Be safeguarded by the word here. Keep safe. But forget about keeping a distance from Christ. Cling to the cross. Like we used to sing when I was younger. To the old rugged cross. Cling. Hold tight. And God will bless you. And we will grow. You will grow in knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection day by day throughout this year, throughout many years to come, hopefully, by the grace of God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you and praise you for your resurrection power, your truth, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness. And we pray that we may live out the implications of these in our life this week, but not just this week, Lord. It has to be a long-term root and branch project to change us every day, every week, every month, all year, every year, because we know we need changing. We know we need a reinvigoration of new life from you day by day as well. So give us grace to trust you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
come now to this very special moment where we remember together the Lord's death and resurrection as well. Paul spoke of those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. We, at this moment, declare ourselves to be friends of the cross. We embrace the cross. We need the cross for our forgiveness. And we rejoice if we are able to share something of Christ's sufferings uh, in the cross. So as we take the bread and wine together, we remember once more what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. I have a moment of quiet reflection just to remember again how much the Lord has given for us, how much we owe him. We can never tell it all, but we remember now. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you did not turn back from the way the Father had marked out for you. We thank you that you drank the cup that he gave you, your father gave you. You took it from his hand and drained it to the dregs, the cup of wrath, the cup of suffering, so that we should not have to drink it. And Lord, we pray that as we take this bread, as we drink this wine, together we would remember and be truly grateful. Help us to feed by faith on you, on your life given for us on the cross. We take and eat this bread in remembrance that Christ died for us and we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And we drink this wine in remembrance of the blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary, the blood which makes us clean from all sin, we drink and give thanks. We praise the Saviour, the one who gave his life for us, the one to whom we owe all that we are, all that we have, all that we ever hope to be. Lord Jesus, receive the gift of our, our offering our hearts to you, Lord. It is little enough. Were the whole realm of nature mine, it were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands, shall have my soul, my life, my all, for your glory. Amen. 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 We sing our closing hymn. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness like a flood. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness. As a flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten. Fiction fountains open deep and wide. 
of God's mercy flow to us and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured in and from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice gives the guilty world in May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and upon us all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours now and evermore. Amen.